This is chapter four, which is the evidence and inquiry chapter. So it's the focus on sociological research. Um, because I also am teaching the intro to research methods uh, course this semester, I am going to be structuring this uh, lecture uh, very similar to how I present the material in that class. Um, so, Although that doesn't mean that there are any parts of the chapter that you won't be responsible for, it does mean that I am adding a little bit of additional material um, and I'll make sure to point that out uh, when we get to those slides. So going back in time, this, this slide should look very familiar um, to uh, a slide that you had um, from chapter one, which was that chapter that introduced sociological theory and the concept of the sociological perspective and sociological imagination. And that's because if you recall, I said that uh, sociology, the scientific study of society and human behavior, um, has two primary characteristics. One being that it uses a sociological perspective and the other being that it does use the scientific method um, because sociology uh, does pride itself on being a science. It is a social science, which is different than of course a natural science, but nevertheless, there is that focus on empiricism. Um, collecting data in a systematic fashion um, and using that to answer questions um, and building upon, uh, you know, empirical knowledge. And so this chapter, this video is going to be focusing more on that scientific method uh, characteristic. Um, beginning with you know, when sociology was first kind of, when that term was first coined by Auguste Comte, um, he was looking for a way in which that we could systematically build upon what he called armchair philosophizing, armchair philosophy. And he said, you know, we all have ideas about how, um, you know, society works, uh, about things that we've noticed and observed in our social worlds. And, but what makes sociology a science is then we need we we build upon those observations in a systematic way um and so it's just really human nature right uh we accumulate knowledge by taking in sensory data but we aren't just passive recipients of that data we actively try to engage with it and make sense of it so we make observations and then we uh, kind of start piecing those observ observations together, noticing patterns, right? And so, you know, if you think about some patterns that you yourself have maybe noticed in the social world, right? Um, and, and at some point when you see that a pattern is repeating itself or you see that a pattern repeats itself, except for like some maybe key deviations, um, you might start, uh, you know, building this kind of experiential knowledge of the world, right? Things that you think you know with some level of confidence about the world around you. Um, but the thing is, is that when we are making these observations and building this experiential knowledge, we have no way of really knowing how accurate our observations are, you know, how complete they are. As human beings, none of us are, you know, omniscient and all knowing. Um, so there are always just going to be gaps in our ability to know things, our gaps, uh, gaps in our ability to observe everything. And so that is why if you think about all the ways in which a person could know something um, and we actually talk about there being five ways of knowing something um, systematic research is considered to be the gold star standard because when you look at those other ways of knowing things for instance logical deduction and logical deduction when you deduce something um, is is when you take you know if you know something about a and you know something about B, and you know that there's a relationship between A and B, then you can deduce C, even if you don't witness C happening, even if you don't observe C, right? But you're deducing C based on what you know about A and B. So, you know, obviously that's not really the, the, the best way to go about knowing something. Um, relying on others, um, particularly others that have more authority than us, this is a very common way of knowing something, and it was especially common you know, when we're young and growing up and we rely on, you know, our parents and our teachers and maybe even our older siblings or friends. 
Uh, experience observation. This is the one that I just mentioned. Um, you know, this is actually the most common way that a lot of adults know things, right? It's through their own experience, through their own observations. But as I noted, that is incomplete information, right? Because you are limited in your ability to observe everything and to know everything. And the final way of knowing something, you know, has kind of fallen out of favor in modern society. But certainly if you read most religious texts, you'll know that mystical revelation used to be a legitimate way of knowing something. You knew something because God told you or because the ancestors told you or something in the spirit world told you. You. Now, of course, you know, that's, <laughs> if, 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 if that is how you claim to know something, uh, you, you probably won't be taken seriously by a lot of people in society. So when you think about all the ways of knowing something, systematic research is considered to be the gold star standard. And why? Why do we consider systematic research to be the best way of knowing something? And that's because you know, if you are engaging in systematic research, it's supposed to control for personal biases. And I'm going to talk more about the concept of biases. I'm going to introduce that concept and talk a little bit more about it at the end of this lecture. It pushes us beyond our personal experience and casual observation. It's right there in the word systematic, right? So you develop a process for how you are taking in phenomena and what you then do with it in terms of analysis. And then it allows us to check up on each other because we're all following the same steps and we are supposed to be transparent when we are disseminating the information that we collect through systematic research. It allows other scientists, other researchers to replicate our, our, our study to see if they get similar findings. Because if they do get similar findings, it gives us confidence that our study was valid, right? That we tapped into the capital T truth, you know, that what we are concluding is accurate. And if people can't um, replicate our study and get the same findings, then of course it raises questions about, you know, the accuracy, the validity of, of whatever we're including. Of, of whatever we're concluding. And so systematic research, you know, it allows us to gather empirical evidence. It allows us to build uh, empirical uh, knowledge. So how do we go about doing that? Well, uh, you've already heard me mention the scientific method and you know, that's just that process by which we, we gather, uh, collect, analyze and disseminate data. And what that looks like in the world of social science is a research model. And the one that I usually teach my students is the eight step model that you see here. Um, and your book does not go over all of these steps. I'm gonna try to only really focus on the steps um, that your book goes over so I don't overload you with material. Um, but, you know, step one is you're selecting a topic, two, define the problem, three, review the literature, four, formulate a hypothesis, five, choose a research method, six, collect the data, seven, analyze the results, eight, share the results, and by doing so, you stimulate more ideas for research or you encourage people to replicate your study, and that generates new hypotheses, and then this starts the process all over again for you and or other researchers. You'll notice that I put a lot of asterisks beside um, formulate a testable hypothesis, and that's because in sociology, social science, um, sometimes we do not always include this step, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that step can be optional um, here in a moment. But first, let's focus on those kind of first two steps because they go hand in hand. You select a topic and you develop your research question. So in sociology really is because the study of society and the people in it um, is such a broad topic, almost any topic is good for sociology. Now, specifically the sociology of health and wellness means that you want to think about health and wellness, not coming from it from a medical model biomedicine approach, but an approach that largely kind of looks at some of the concerns of the social model. So, you know, you're interested in the social processes that underlie uh, individuals health as well as the larger community and population health as well as the social consequences that come from uh, health conditions and illnesses that exist um, among individuals and in within communities. Once you have a topic, you then need to develop a research question. 
And so there are kind of four types of questions, but only one of those types is really uh, suitable for systematic research. And that's empirical, because empirical means that this is a question that can be answered by the collection of data. Um, it, it, it is uh, possible for you to use empiricism to get to the capital T truth, meaning the truth is out there that it is knowable. Um, Let's talk about whether the other three are not good questions um, for social for systematic research. Aesthetic. Um, aesthetic is a matter of taste, and taste is going to vary between people. Um, and there isn't going to be a, a capital T truth for you to get to. For instance, let's say your topic was exercise. Um, an aesthetic type taste, uh, an aesthetic type question, I mean, might be something like, which is more enjoyable? dancing for fitness or um, swimming for fitness. Well, there is no capital T truth there because, you know, that really just comes down to people's preference. You know, you might love to dance, you might love to swim, you might be like me and don't particularly enjoy either one. Um, so that's not the type of question um, that you can ask. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, you can turn an aesthetic question into an empirical question by shifting the focus. Um, so an empirical question might be something like, does a person's gender influence whether they prefer swimming or dancing in terms of fitness activities? Right. Um, that is a knowable uh, question. That is a question you can get at. Right. It, can you can you find a, a gender difference in your given population when it comes to exercise preference? Moral questions, very similar to aesthetic questions, because now you're asking, you know, is something moral, is something right? Um, and that's going to vary based on people's own morals and value systems. And once again, there isn't going to be like a capital T, uh, you know, truth, um, you know, uh, type, type of uh, response there. Um, you know, so if you are asking a question like, um, you know, is uh is abortion um is 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 abortion acceptable that's not an empirical question acceptable to whom and and that's going to vary person to person um that isn't going to be a capital t truth uh you know the way that question is worded you aren't going to be able to answer that using systematic research because there there is not a knowable answer once again you can turn a moral question into an empirical question by shifting your focus you might say something like um When it comes to different religious denominations, uh, Christianity, uh, Judaism, um, uh, Buddhist, Hindu, and Muslim, um, which one is most and least likely to define abortion as being acceptable, right? That's now an empirical statement of that moral question. And then finally, interpretation question, like, you know, that should just be a given as to why that's not acceptable. Like when we say, oh, that's open interpretation or that's your interpretation. If you're asking someone an interpretive question, once again, it's going to vary person by person, um, you know, um, and so there isn't going to be that 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 given truth out there, um, you know. So an interpret interpretation question might be something like, um, when the directions on this uh, exercise video say uh, work as hard as you can how did you interpret the instructor's directions, right? So, you know, you're gonna get a lot of different answers and, and, and you aren't going to be able to pinpoint which one of them is right because all of them are equally right because all of them reflect a, a given person's interpretation. So big takeaway here is that, you know, you after you have a topic, your research question needs to be an empirical question, right? It needs to be a question um, that is knowable 
um, and that is knowable by collecting data. Um, that is the only type of question that systematic research can answer. Now, we're skipping ahead. Um, I, I mentioned that step four, that uh, constructing a hypothesis is not always necessary in sociology. And that's because in sociology, as well as some other social sciences like anthropology, for instance, um, we, there are actually two different types of research that researchers uh, can, can engage in. One is called deductive research and the other one is called inductive research. And I give you a nifty little model there. Deductive research is the type of research that best aligns with the scientific method research model, those eight steps. It's, you know, you begin with some ideas, usually based on other research that's already been conducted and disseminated, and you define your question um, by, you know, conducting a literature review of what's already been done, you formulate a hypothesis, you collect your data, you analyze it and interpret your data and then you publish your results um, where you either reject or uh, reject or uh, you know support your hypothesis um, that's deductive research inductive research is when you have a question but you know maybe it's a question where a lot of research hasn't been done or it's been done but it, it hasn't necessarily been done in the way that you're going to do it but for whatever reason you are not going to turn to what's already known after defining your question you're going to go out in your field and collect data so there is no hypothesis you're not speculating on what you expect to find because that speculation is based on what has been done previously and you aren't starting with that in inductive research. So you collect your data, then you analyze and interpret that data. Then you, once you have some sense of what you're working with and what you found, then you compare it to prior research. Sometimes it leads to you going back into the field to collect more data, to fill in gaps. But eventually at some point you form some new ideas and then you publish your, your, your results. And so there is no hypothesis step in inductive research. Now you'll see here that I say that, you know, commonly deductive research involves quantitative research methods and inductive research is much more often associated with qualitative research. Um, I will say that sometimes, um, you know, you can use qualitative research methods with the deductive model. It's much more rare for people to use quantitative research if they're doing the inductive model. Um, it just rarely uh, cuts that way. So now let's talk a little bit about what I mean when I say quantitative research and qualitative research. So qualitative, quantitative research is data that can be quantified, that can be turned into numbers. And that's key because this type of data analysis oftentimes involves computer programs like SPSS, Stata, SAS, that takes your data and now that it's been quantified, it helps you run uh, mathematical analyses, linear and logistic regressions and correlations and those types of things. Um, because you are collecting data that can be quantified, uh, usually um, you're asking questions in what we call closed-ended questions that give people, uh, you know, a limited range of choices, and that's what allows us to turn this into uh, numbers. Um, and so this this type of method is really good if for large-scale surveys where you're asking a lot of items, and for surveys that are going out to large sample sizes, right? Because after you collect the data, you you um, you know you put put it in the system, uh, you enter it in, into the computer system, but then the computer system does a lot of the cleaning up and it, it does all the analyses. Um, and so it's not very time consuming comparative to what we're gonna talk about here in a second when we talk about qualitative research. Um, so qualitative research is just data that cannot be quantified. You're gathering usually textual data. Um, and so this is data that is, you know, people's words and, 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 and or writings and or your observations. Um, and so because it's not quantified, even though there are, there are, there are, uh, you know, uh, data packages uh, that, you know, 
code uh, qualitative data for you, it is much more time consuming. So for this type of research methodology, usually it's much smaller size and you're usually asking, um, you can't ask as many questions. And so the trade-off is this, with quantitative research, you can talk to a lot of people about a lot of things, but you're only going to get probably a superficial level of understanding behind, you know, those items because you're going to have to use it usually close ended or for the most part close ended questions where you give people choices. So you, you can't ask a lot of whys and hows and tell me abouts, right? That doesn't work for quantitative research. But like I said, you can ask about a lot of things and you can ask it to a lot of people. Um, qualitative research, you can ask the whys and the hows and get all the stories. So it gives you that in-depth knowledge, but the limitation is going to be, um, you know, you're going to have to ask a smaller range of questions to a much smaller number of people. Um, so, you know, the example I give here is, you know, if you just wanted to know, like, what percentage of US parents use corporal punishment? That's the type of question that can be easily answered with quantitative research. But if you wanna know why parents in certain demographic groups are more or less likely to use spanking as a disciplinary method, well, that becomes a more complicated question. If you really wanna get at people's motivations and rationales, you probably need to ask open-ended questions for that. And that's gonna be that textual data that can't be quantified. And so you're going to have a smaller sample. So specifically, when we're talking about research designs, right, qualitative, quantitative are the ways in which we can kind of classify these designs, but the, the designs themselves, you know, vary, right? They're, they're, they're multiple types of research designs. Your book goes over a handful, um, and the ones that your book goes over, I put in red. Um, so those are really just going to be the ones that I focus on here. Um, like I said, I'm not trying to overwhelm you. Um, I know that this is not my research methodology class. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about uh, two types that have multiple different other types um, underneath that type, um, you know, uh, surveys and field work. So a survey is a tool um, that can be given to a group of people in order to determine characteristics, opinions, and behaviors. Uh, the key thing about all surveys is that they rely on self-reported data. You're not doing any observations or witnessing uh, any type of behavior yourself. Um, surveys can take uh, two primary formats, and, and usually the format um, is a, a questionnaire. And the key thing about a questionnaire is the respondent is reading the questions for themselves. They have access to the instrument. Um, there isn't another person, you know, uh, that's kind of walking them through the instrument. Um, and sometimes this is important because people are like, okay, this means maybe people will be more honest, um, especially if it's sensitive data, they won't feel the need to impress or lie to the interviewer which brings me to the other type, which is interviews. Um, interviews are, you know, it, there is a second person there. There is a interviewer that is asking the questions on the survey instrument. And so this definitely takes some of the power out of the hand of the respondent and allows the interviewer to kind of control the pace. Um, but like I said, that trade-off there might be, people might be less inclined um, to, uh, reveal certain sensitive data, um, even with promises of confidentiality, if it's in this interview process. And then the format itself, um, you know, for an interview, it can be in person or telephone. And questionnaires, um, it can be uh, email or in person, like a hard copy of a questionnaire. Focus groups are a uh, special type of survey where instead of there being um, a, or a special type of interview where instead of it being one-on-one, -on -one, you now have the interviewer talking to, or the facilitator as they're often called, talking to a, a group of people at one time. Once again, um, this type of, of methodology is best if you aren't asking sensitive questions um, 
And if for whatever reason, if you're wanting to get some sense of the social interaction or the power dynamics that come into play when discussing certain topics uh, in small groups, then focus group data can be particularly helpful for that. Now, questionnaires um, don't have to be closed-ended. Um, but they tend to be most effective and efficient when they are closed ended. And like I said, this is what allows them uh, to be, um, you know, for, for it to be quantitative uh, methodology. Um, and so this is a closed ended question is a question that gives people a limited range of, of answer options, um, because this is then what allows, uh, you know, the SPSS or the SAS or the SCADA program to then change it into numbers. Um, interviews, it's worth noting, um, they can be uh, close-ended, in which case you're really just reading the instrument out um, to the respondent. And in this, in that case, that type of interview would still be uh, quantitative in in nature but a lot of interviews because a lot of people are, you know are like well that would kind of be a waste of time and once again by involving interviewers as opposed to just doing it as a questionnaire um, you would be you would face some limitations in terms of how many people you could then give the questionnaire you could then give the 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 survey to um, so for a lot of times with interviews, your book calls them uh, semi-structured questions. I'm calling them open-ended questions, right? The interview still has a, a, a instrument, right? You still have a list of questions, but the questions are now open-ended and you aren't providing people responses. And usually in a semi-structured interview, there is freedom to veer away from the instrument and ask follow-up questions as well as to ask probing and clarification questions. This type of survey instrument, um, this type of open-ended interview obviously results in qualitative data. Now field work um, is always qualitative uh, in nature um, because you are going out into the real world um, and these are not situations that you manipulate at all so this isn't experimentation um, and you're usually collecting uh, your observation in the form of notes which you then uh, analyze you code um, so as it says here field work often uses in-depth extended set study to describe and analyze a group or community. Your book specifically mentions ethnographies, which they call deep hanging out. So it's worth noting like ethnography is like an even more intense form of field work. Um, usually most ethnographies in order to really understand the community and immerse themselves in it, usually you're looking for at least a year minimum um, in terms of the amount of time that you spend out in the field. Now, what you do when you're out in the field um, kind of depends on are you doing a participant observation or a detached observation, um, also called non-participant observation. Participant observation, you are part of the action. Although you're not manipulating the situation, the people that you interact with, um, you are interacting with people in the field site. Um, so in, in some ways, you're part of the story. And admittedly, this is the type of research methodology that makes um, some people in the natural sciences kind of iffy about, you know, how scientific sociology is. Uh, a good example of a book that actually is a participant observation. It's actually ethnography, um, just given his level of immersion and the amount of time that he's spent in the area. But um, it's uh, called Gang Leader for a Day. And this was a sociology doctoral student. This was the book that came out of his dissertation. And basically he was writing about how street gangs kind of regulate themselves and their communities. Um, and he befriended, you know, he was living in this and near this neighborhood and, you know, and befriended one of the, the, the gang leaders so much so that he really got a firsthand look at a lot of the interaction um, and the accounts um, and you know he talked to people while uh, he was he was uh, kind of doing these observations and they knew who he was right um, but it wasn't semi-structured interviews and a lot of it is observational data non-participant observation 
uh, you know, I like to tell people this is like the lurker in the corner with the notepad. You know, you're not part of the story. You're there in the field site, but you are not necessarily directly interacting or engaging um, with uh, the, the people in the community or you're making sure that your engagement is very limited in scope. You yourself, you are not part of, of the story. You are not part of the action. And so for this class, um, you know, that's it in terms of what you need to know about research methodology. Um, you know, we'll come, we'll, we'll have examples of studies um, uh, throughout uh, the throughout the the semester and as you all start your SSRPs um, you know hopefully as you're doing finding your academic sources that information about you know methods will be helpful in helping you understand the methodology sections of the academic articles you decide upon uh, before I leave you um, and wrap up this this lecture uh, I want to talk about ethics um, and values. So ethics comes up at the end of this chapter. I'm adding the information on values because when I teach this in my research methods class, I almost feel like you can't talk about ethics without also talking about values and then just going ahead and throwing in the word bias because I think all three of those terms can be very conflated and, and students can can believe that they all mean the same thing or something similar, um, but they actually mean very distinct things. So, you know, first of all, you know, what are ethics? Well, these are the 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 you ought to's right. This is the these are the kind of rules of, of, of behavior. It is kind of the stance that that people take about, you know, how you should uh, engage with people in a just and honest and upfront fashion. And so when we talk about the code of ethics or what's also called ethical rules, some of them that frequently come up in regards to research are things like informed consent, making sure that people know what they're signing up for, um, that if you have to use any type of ruse or if you have to be anything less than honest about the true intent of the study, um, that you know that that you're not just lying for you know lying sake in order to get people to participate another kind of common ethical rule is confidentiality which isn't the same thing as anonymity um you know oftentimes researchers know who's participating in their study, right? They collect demographic data. Obviously, in the case of interviews, you're talking to the person. If it's a face-to-face -face interview, you know, you're sitting in front of them. If you're doing a participant observation, especially ethnography, you probably know a lot of details about your their life. They don't have to be anonymous to you. But in almost all research, what we do promise is that we will do our best to protect their privacy so that they are confidential to other people, the other people that come and read your notes, um, that read whatever you then disseminate, whether it's an article, whether it's a book, that steps will be taken to keep their personal data safe and secure, and that, you know, you will protect their identity um, in your research itself. Uh, we protect subjects from harm, um, you know, uh, this is both physical harm uh, as well as psychological harm, um, you know, and, and this has become um, a much more important kind of ethical rule after, you know, the 50s and the 60s, um, post-World War II, um, and, and some studies that came out in that, that decade or so after that, uh, this rule wasn't really being as enforced. It wasn't seen as being as critical. Um, and there are many examples of research subjects who were treated poorly and who were harmed. Um, in my research methods class, they talk specifically about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. This is one that comes up often, um, in, especially when considering uh, how certain racial groups have, have very uh, distrustful stances 
uh, towards uh, medicine and research and the government. Um, and so for African Americans, um, you know, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, sometimes it's wrongfully described as, oh, the government gave black men syphilis. And that's not what happened. Um, but what they did do was they took men who were infected by syphilis and they studied them because they wanted to study the progression of syphilis. But um, about halfway through the study, a vaccine for syphilis was found. Um, and, and, and instead of treating these men and protecting their sexual partners and their eventual spouses and their children, um, the, the people in charge of the study withheld that vaccine and information um, from them. Um, and they also were flagrantly dishonest to them, making them think that they were treating them when really they were not. Um, they were not treating um, their disease at all. They were just kind of studying the effects of it. Um, I give you a little video um, there if you would like to learn more. Um, another kind of common ethical rule is that we protect subjects from coercion. Um, you know, that people should be a part of informed consent is that you give your you give your free consent to participate. And in some cases, your consent is not free. You know, this is why people have to be very careful, for instance, when they're using uh, incarcerated uh, populations, whether they're in prisons or in, or in mental hospitals, right? Because, you know, can their consent really truly be freely given? Um, usually there is implied coercion there. Similarly, a lot of universities, it used to be very common when I was in school, pretty much, um, you know, the couple of times that I took a, a psychology class in particular, because psychology loves experiments, they would pretty much be like, oh, yes, for 10% of your grade, you have to participate in seven experiments this, this semester or whatever. And a lot of universities have moved away from that because this is a form of coercion, right? Um, you know, it's part of your grade. Nobody wants to take a zero from it. You aren't really allowed to say, nah, I'm not comfortable doing that because there's this power dynamic between the, in the professors of researchers um, and uh, their students, right? And so while you certainly can, as a professor, have a project and invite students to participate, a lot of institutional review boards, those are are the uh, re bodies on campus uh, normally comprised of several individuals that oversee research proposals, but a lot of those uh, institutional review boards, also called IRBs, have kind of in a lot of campuses like made it a policy that, you know, professors cannot require participation um, in research as part of a grade um, because that is a form of coercion. And the final thing is that, um, and this becomes more relevant as people disseminate um, their information and they publish and they tweet about it and they go on, you know, TV is you want to acknowledge conflicts, conflicts of interest, right? Like if you find out, if, if you do a project, uh, do a research study and you just in, in, in your research study, you're like, actually, smoking is not as bad as we thought. Um, and you happen to be, you know, supported by R.J. Reynolds, a huge tobacco company, you know, that's the type of information that you need to be transparent with um, when you are disseminating your information. It doesn't necessarily mean that the information that you're, you, you are disseminating is, is inherently bad or biased, but, you know, it's a bad look to not acknowledge that uh, clear and overt conflict of interest. And since I went ahead and brought up the B word, bias, this brings me to my final slide and kind of my final, uh, you know, set of points that, that I want you to consider and know. And all of this is new material. Um, so we have these ethical rules that are set for us, um, you know, that are, that, are, that are set for us by our professional organizations, by our universities, our research centers. Um, but then what about our own sense of what's right and wrong or our own sense of I really care about this or I really want to study this? Well, that's not really ethics. That's values, right? That's that personal kind of code of this is what I feel to be true. This is what I feel to be important. This is what I feel is good and right in this world. 
And this becomes a little tricky because we like to think about scientists as being these objective, neutral people, right? And objectivity is the ability to perceive and represent the object of study accurately without personal preference or judgment. And the opposite of this is subjective thinking, right? Where, where, where you are so adamant that, you know, you feel a certain way or you see the world a certain way or you want this certain outcome that you aren't able to perceive or represent your study um, without letting your judgment, you know, kind of shade your perception and representation. Now, Oftentimes students say, well, if I really care about this, like let's say you really care about uh, the stigma associated with mental illness. You're like, you know, how can I be objective about it? How can I be objective about it if I really care about this? Well, that's because even though you can be objective, being objective doesn't necessarily require you to be value free. Most research isn't value free. Researchers spend a lot of time and, and, and in some cases money, their own money, and if they're lucky it's grant money, um, but certainly they spend a lot of time and energy and effort and, and, and frustration and tears and triumphs and so much, so much of their personal life wrapped around in their research. It would be weird if they spent all that time on something they didn't care about, right? Um, no one expects value-free judgment because you get to remember, you get to choose your own topic. And we understand that a lot of that is aligned with what you value, what you feel like is important. So it's not about having value-free research. You can have your research uh, be influenced by your values, but what you need to aim for is value neutrality because value neutrality will allow you to uphold the expectation of objectivity. And value neutrality is where you don't let your personal beliefs interfere right? Like your values can help you decide what subject, you know, what topic you want to study, what question you want to ask. But then once you start that process of setting up your research model, of deciding your sample, of deciding on methodology, of collecting your data and analyzing your data, at this point, you need to be value neutral. Um, and this becomes important because people like to throw the B word bias around a lot. And it's worth noting that like a lot of concepts, there are a lot of definitions to bias. But when we're talking about bias as being a quality that is or is not present in research, there's a specific definition. And that is a characteristic of results that systematically misrepresent the full dimensions of what's being studied. Key word there is systematically. It's not accidental. It's not that you overemphasize one part over the other. No, 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 no. It's like you systematically misrepresent, right? So it is that opposite of objectivity where you're supposed to represent the object of the study accurately, right? You're instead now not just engaging in subjective thinking, but you are setting up your um, setting up your study and, and analyzing and disseminating your results in a systematic fashion to, to, to be biased, to be false. Um, and, you know, two ways in which that, you know, research can be biased is selective observation, right, where, where you make decisions um, based on, uh, you know, what you think will get you the answer that you are looking for. Um, in, you know, so it's like, oh, okay, if I am wanting to uh, study situations where I think the mentally ill are being stigmatized, and I purposely choose locations and situations that I feel like I'm more likely to find examples of what I'm looking for, that's selective observation, right? What you really sh should do is have a range of observations to truly see is what you are suspecting exist, you know, is it really out there when you're not trying to control the outcome by being selective about where, where and what you observe. And then another kind of bias that is overgeneralization, right, where you take a quality that does appear in the population, but then you overgeneralize it. Um, so that it seems or sounds like that, you know, all people who are from this group 
behave in this manner. Um, you know, overgeneralizations uh, normally come up when people are disseminating their research, right? Where instead of being really clear about what percentage or proportion of people did this or said this or found this, they instead and talk about it like it is a group level characteristic. And we call that an overgeneralization. The final thought I want to leave you with, um, because some of you are going to start engaging with your academic articles and your topics a lot sooner than others, is, you know, when you get to that part of the research article, after they present their results, there's normally a discussion where they talk about their interpretation and they contextualize it. Um, and this is a point that your book makes. Once again, this is the part of sociology, which is, this, you know, that study of human society and human behavior. Um, because it's so much less precise than, you know, pouring chemicals in a, in a beaker in a lab, this is that part that makes some people kind of question the science of sociology. Um, because when you're talking about human behavior that can have a lot of correlates and a lot of causes, there's rarely only one interpretation. And sometimes there's not even a clear right interpretation. Um, but just because there are multiple interpretations doesn't mean that this is the same thing as an opinion, and nor does is this an example of being biased, right? So, you know, if, if you get a finding and there are multiple ways you can interpret it, and once again, you know, you decide to lean on the interpretation that most aligns with your values, um, particularly if you still present the other interpretations as being a possibility, this isn't systematically misrepresenting the full dimension of what's being studied. Um, and this happens in sociology more often than not. All right, so that is it with research. Um, for those of you who won't be having to do your uh, annotated bibliographies for a very long while, I strongly suggest that this is the video that you come back to and rewatch um, as you get to the point where you start preparing your own article review.